Powered from the Sereno Cigar Company studio in North Carolina, it's episode one of the Primetime Show. This week, we go number one as we welcome Casey Hogan from Crux Cigar Company. Our soon-to-be renamed Hot Topic segment, and we'll explain why, will cover the TAA exclusive series of cigars. And we also bring a special segment back to the podcast airwaves. So stay tuned. This segment of the Primetime Show is brought to you by Saga Cigars, makers of the Saga Golden Age Cigar. The Golden Age is a cigar that takes you back to the classic days of cigar smoking. Through six generations of experience by the Reyes family, the Saga Golden Age delivers a timeless blend that uses the nobility of the tobacco to bring you the perfect balance of power and flavor. It narrates better than words a family's tradition in tobacco, delivering much like the ones they used to smoke during the times of Hemingway. Saga Golden Age is a full-bodied, full-flavored Dominican Puro. With tobaccos from one farm, the blend features a Corojo 2006 wrapper and filler from the original Cuban seeds grown in the Dominican Republic. Available in four sizes at an affordable price, the Saga Golden Age is sure to please and take you back to a journey of yesteryear. And sponsored by Drew Estate. Check out and download the Drew Diplomat app for your mobile device. Keep up with everything going on, Drew Estate. Experience the subculture that is the Rebirth of Cigars. Available on iTunes or Google Play. For more information, check out www.drewdiplomat.com. Villager Cigars. Since 1888, Villager Cigars have been experts in everything tobacco, including offering a wide range of premium cigars for all connoisseurs. Try the new Sandoro line featuring the Sandoro Maduro, the Sandoro Claro, and the Sandoro Colorado, rated in the top 25 cigars of the year by Cigar Aficionado for 2016. Visit their entire line of premium cigars at villagercigars.com. Welcome, everybody, to the inaugural number one or first episode of the Primetime Show, powered by Cigar Coop. I'm in the new Sereno Cigar Company studio here um, in North Carolina, and I am I'm really happy to be back on the podcast airwaves. It's been a little while, so to speak, so I'm, I'm really, really happy. Um, we have a really, really good show, and I'm going to bring in uh, my main co-host uh, for the show, and we're going to talk a little more about it. I'm really, really glad to have this man um, as a part of the team, Mr. Aaron Loomis of Developing Parrots. Aaron, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to be a part of this show. I'm really excited about it. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, Aaron, my when I kind of brought to you the vision of this show, um, and and I think what I what I was looking to accomplish, and I think you kind of think I think we think a lot alike. Maybe we differ on something, but the goal with this show, what I wanted to do, is deliver a, a podcast that was what I call industry centric. Mm -hmm. You know, I, and and there's a lot of great shows out there, and and I love them all. But I felt as far as just with that industry focus, this is what. Uh, I was looking to have on on the podcast. So uh, we're, we're we're on episode one. It is a I would say it's a, a work in progress, so to speak. We're not going to try to build Rome in a day, but you'll see as the show evolves. I think we'll be putting more enhancements and tweaking content and doing a lot of things. So uh, really excited about this. Yeah, I think it'll be good to be able to kind of let the show evolve over time, see what works, what doesn't work, and then uh, like you said, very industry focused, being able to bring in some good guests and. Uh, kind of talk about things, maybe some things that are a little controversial and uh, kind of get people uh, talking about some of the topics we go over. Yeah, you know, and one of our one of our segments, uh, before we bring in Casey Hogan from Crux Cigars, I want to just talk about one of our segments I said is the soon-to-be-renamed Hot Topics segment. Um, and I brought to you a reason, and I don't know if we find, well, you and I have been talking about a name, I don't think we actually finalized it yet, but right. um, problem. here's a problem with Hot Topics. The View is using it. <laughs> right. I mean, I don't care if they want to sue me, right? But but I cannot have a. I, we cannot have the primetime show have the view. We we they exactly. Have, so I I did get confirmation. It was because I was told from someone it was a segment on the view, and I I didn't believe it until I did go do some uh, fact checking on that, as we're always going to do on this show. This is, and and I did confirm. And, and and I googled it, and before the video had a chance to run, I just closed my window because I'm, I'm this is a view-free show. So, right. So, 
you know, uh, so, so yeah, so we are going to, it's going to be, hopefully by next week, we'll have the name finalized. Aaron came up with some really good suggestions that I just want to, uh, I didn't want to do it a few minutes before the show, but we will have that nailed down as far as, uh, a, so, but that's where Aaron and I, we're going to talk about the things in that segment that I feel are the things on every, maybe cigar geek's mind or cigar, you know, someone who loves cigars, the things you're talking about, if you're really into cigars, those are the things we're going to talk about. Tonight, we're going to talk about TAA cigars, which are Tobacconist Association of America exclusive cigars. And I have some really strong comments that are going to get me into a lot of trouble tonight. <laughs> so just be ready for that. I'll back um, you up. Don't worry about that. And, and then we are, going to, we are going to – that will be our final segment. But before that, we will actually do a um, – we're going to bring a special segment to the airwaves, which we'll announce after Casey's segment. And then we're going to smoke tonight the Crux the Connoisseur. Which uh, you and I, so it's interesting. The, uh, before it, the Crux the Connoisseur was my cigar of the year, mm-hmm. but it was your, I guess the best way to put you, it was your number one ranked cigar of the year. Is that the best well, way? Well, it wasn't, the, yeah, not the Connoisseur, but another Crux. Right. I'm sorry. You're right. I'm sorry. A, you had a Crux cigar, which was the IPCPR Limitada. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, the uh, the connoisseur didn't make it um, just based on the release date. Uh, just and we do a calendar year for uh, what's uh, uh, eligible. So it, the uh, the connoisseur was a I think was a month a month too early. But otherwise, uh, we would have went and did a review on it as well. Yep. Yep. So, but there's a difference in terms of your yours is ba- mine's based on basically a ranking that I have subjectively put together. Mm-hmm. based on some criteria. I don't want to say it was it there's criteria that I put. Yours mm-hmm. was more of a quantit I want to say yours was more of a quantitative analysis that you know for right for a calendar year you it was the highest scoring cigar. Exactly. So we really just do it based on score. So we don't um you know, we rank each cigar individually and then um we don't kind of add any uh additional criteria after the fact. We just kind of r- rate them by based on the total score that they scored during that during that time frame. Right. So Aaron and I, so Aaron and I, we both had this top ranked cigar and we were, we were trying to come up with who to have as our first guest. And it was like, so obvious Aaron actually brought it to my attention. It's we got to have some, we got to have Casey from crooks. Um, right. So it, it was, it was a natural fit. And, I, and I've been wanting to talk to Casey uh, for a while on, on a podcast. So I'm going to introduce Casey, but in one second, what I want to just talk about is real quick is for folks listening tonight, Cigar Coop Challenge coins. They have actually, people actually have been interested in these things. Uh, I'm going to give away three of these tonight. Um, here's all you got to do. The, you got to listen for a password that I'm going to say, and I'm going to give the password that will be said sometime during the show. You have to tell me the segment that's a part of. Um, you email coop, C-O-O-P, at cigar-coop.com with that segment name. And I'll pick three winners at random for these limited edition Cigar Coop Challenge coins. So 2011, 2011. All right. So without further ado, Casey Hogan from Crux Cigar Company. Casey, welcome to the inaugural edition of the Primetime Show. But before you start, I just want to kind of say, I've been wanting to tell you this for a while. Uh, Hey, go Crux yourself. (laughs) It's about as vulgar as you get. Right, right, right. So, so before we get, I got to just tell a little story because it was about a. I'm, I'm, I'm big on if folks know me. I'm big on timelines, right? And I'm big on like you know if you see these Facebook memories, I'm big. So it was about a year ago, two weeks ago. I'm, I'm down in in uh, Miami, Florida, at La Zona Palooza, and Casey's actually got his office at the Espinosa headquarters. He has like a subspace. And it, I remember, forget it was like Friday afternoon. It was like 90 degrees, and it was much more humid than I remember. And everyone's going outside to play dodgeball. And I'm like, I'm, I'm not taking this heat well. So I'm sitting and Casey kind of just sees me. He goes, Hey, you want to come hang out in my office? We'll, we'll grab a smoke. And I'm like, man, I don't know if I could smoke. I'm like thinking, but why not? Right. So I go in there and, and Casey's got like all the air conditioning at the Espinosa. <laughs> right. So this thing was five degrees in there. Yeah. So, and, and Aaron, you were just down there. I know you were just right. down there as well. Um, and what, what really, I le- it was a great afternoon because I learned the whole vision and the story of the Crux Company, and, I, and that's what I want to kind of share with everyone tonight. 
have Casey share. So Casey, thanks for coming, man. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. It's definitely an honor to be on uh, your inaugural show, and also appreciate both you guys for uh, you know the accolades uh, for uh, last year's cigars. We're both of you giving us cigar number one. Really appreciate that from all of us at Crux. Oh, no problem. No problem at all. Uh, you know, so Casey, we kind of um, just for folks who may uh, not be familiar with, with Crux um, cigars, what's the, give us the one on one about your company. Quick one on one at Crux. Uh, we launched uh, in April of 2014 uh, with a unique size uh, with an Infomaniac, which we'll get into later, I'm sure. Uh, but then we really kind of just did that before the show to get some, uh, hopefully, get some uh, name recognition going into the 2014 IPCPR. Uh, so then at the IPCPR 2014, we actually finished launching our 2014 releases. And at the time, it was six blends. So we came out of the scene, kind of out of the gates with a lot of offerings, small ring gauge to large ring gauge. We had as small as a 32 ring gauge all the way up to a 60 ring gauge. And we wanted to come to market with not just a cigar. We wanted to come to market with a company. And having a portfolio that was semi-versatile um, at that point uh, gave us the best chance of succeeding as a company instead of um, singles and cigars. So over the last uh, basically three years, uh, we're going into our third show here in 17, uh, it'll be our fourth show in 17, excuse me. We've done three. Uh, you know, we're in a little over 200 retailers across the country. Uh, we got a good team, a lot of guys around us. Um, and essentially what it does, our, our team is my cousin, Jeff, who does 100% of our blending. Uh, he's, uh, the guy who spent many weeks, 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 um, in Central America, before we even launched in April of 2014, he spent about a week, a month uh, down there for over three years. So 40, 50 trips, you know, kind of doing a SWOT analysis of all the factories, learning the blending process. Um, and after his due diligence, we, we settled on the factory with Placencia Cigars uh, and that family. And they're a great factory, the amount of tobacco they have. Uh, and then we have Mark, who's our design guy, who's a partner in the company um, as well. Um, and, you know, the, there's a lot of us that wear a lot of different hats. Um, but not to fast forward too far, um, you know, so it's kind of a, a still a very boutique company, um, right around 200 or so retailers. Um, but we all have our, our, key, our key pieces to this, to this company. So, Casey, with Jeff, he – this is something that was really impressive is Jeff just didn't go and say – the person say, hey, I want to get a cigar and I want to release it to market. He did, like you said, he did this. He actually engraved himself in the factory, from what I understand. Correct. Well, Jeff, even even rewind for Jeff. I mean, he uh, started off, um, I don't know the exact year, but roughly 23-ish years ago, we'll say. Uh, he opened his first retail store in, uh, you know, the greater metropolitan area of Minneapolis, Minnesota. And he started as a retailer. And with the tobacco tax as high as it is in Minnesota, after years and years of, you know, being, you know, a retailer, um, you know, I started working for him. And this was in, in the late 2000s. And, uh, you know, he had always had some visions of going outside of the retail aspect. So I was there in uh, 2007, 8, and 9 with him um, and ended up leaving uh, Minneapolis because of the sake of the cold. Um, but we had always had this vision. Uh, he had said he really wanted to get in the manufacturing side. I needed a little bit more real life experience. Uh, I had just kind of got out of college and playing baseball. And uh, so I moved away. He said in about five years, we had a plan. So he's got retail background. I mean, 20 plus years retail background. But then your question is he got into, uh, yeah, he immersed himself in there. I mean, he didn't want to show up and just say, you know, I want to buy a cigar. I want to take this to market. It was um, years before 2014, April 14th, or April of two, not April 14th, April 2014, it took, it took years of, of preparation to get to that launch point, um, with branding, with marketing, with, um, all the, um, uh, the pillars in place to set a successful company to succeed. Um, not only that is learning the, uh, different regions of tobacco more at the blending process and actually going through an education you know, that he gave himself by spending and immersing himself in, in all, in all countries. I mean, Dominican, Honduran and, and Nicaraguan as well. Will Cooper here with Aaron Loomis. We have Casey Hogan of Crux Cigar Company. This is episode one of the primetime show. And we're, we're talking to Casey. So Casey, what exactly is your current role right now with Crux? 
Well, my current role, I joke about it because like our current role, I mean, we basically have, you know, three major pillars in our company and we all wear a lot of hats. Um, and so, I mean, by title, they call me the vice president. Um, I also like to look at the chief bottle washer. Um, I'm the guy that's, you know, traveling the country predominantly. I'm in and out of the factory doing quality control. Um, uh, Mark's kind of got the uh, the graphic design side. He's got all of our brands, and then and then Jeff obviously is is the president of our company and the the owner, and uh, he does all the blending, and then uh, he also travels the country as well. So I mean, we've got a lot of things that we cover. Uh, we try to keep ourselves pretty lean because we're a brand new company. We want to be able to put you know all of our efforts into making great cigars. Aaron, uh, I'm sorry, Amy, Aaron. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no worries. <laughs> so some of the unique th unique things about uh, the Crux offerings, that uh, one is the the marble head. How how did that kind of come about? About uh, as a feature that you wanted to use, kind of throughout some of the lines. As people ask, the marble head is if they can see this shape. So essentially, we are uh, a company of a bunch of guys from Minnesota, um, German Norwegian descent. And so we wanted to tie in some Cuban history into our shapes, sizes, and brands, and not essentially have a Cuban-sounding company because that's not our history. Uh, but we wanted to pay some some tribute to that. So the Marblehead is actually based off of the old Cuban 109 shape. The 109 is essentially uh, I'll give you another look here, which this is on the IPCPR limited edition. Uh, it's kind of a hacked-off torpedo. Uh, we made all our own molds so we can get consistency in this head. Um, but it is like a hacked off torpedo. It's an old Cuban shape, the 109, that allows you to have some more mouth control, some more cut control, some more smoke flavor. Um, but um, we wanted to tie that in instead of just coming out with, you know, all round caps or, or all torpedoes or all figurados. Uh, we wanted to have some unique sizes. So the Cuban 109, which we call the marble head, which is trademarked by Crux Cigars, um, we use that as our old homage to 109. And you're talking about sizes. Correct. You, you, meant, you mentioned this at the beginning. Your go-to-market was completely against the grain <laughs> where the market was going. Well, uh, our first cigar <laughs> in 2014 ever to hit, the, ever to hit uh, retailers was a 7 by 33 uh, We call it – it's an old Cuban size. It's based off the old – some Cuban heritage as well. Uh, this is what they call – uh, a 7x33, the old Cuban size is Nympha. Um, we added a double perfecto, and it's uh, we call it a Nymphomaniac. So it's a 7x33 double perfecto. was the first cigar we came to market with in two in two blends, which was a natural and a dark, sun-grown and shade-grown. Um, yeah, we came to market with a 7x33. Um, obviously, it was going to be one of our initial releases, um, but it got people talking about Crux. I mean, who are these guys coming to the market with a 7x33 inch ring gauge? I mean, like... Why would anybody want to do that? Well, A, because we were preparing ourselves for the IPCPR in 2014. And we wanted to try to, you know, stir up some, some kind of buzz. Anything we could do to try to get something out. Because we did have the rest of our 2014 portfolio ready to unveil. So we came with the 7x33 Double Perfecto. And then you had some other uh, smaller Vitolas. I, one of the initial releases that you came out with was the Skeeters as well, and that was a, a small Vitola, small length Vitola as well. Correct. Um, that was like four by thirty-two, which was all long filler, all hand rolled Perito. And then somewhat recently, you came out with the Sports, was which is a somewhat similar size, right? The Sports is actually an old Cuban size as well. That ties into that Cuban history. Uh, it's four and five eighths by thirty-five. So it's not. I always tell people it's it's not our love for athletics. It's that's paying tribute to an old Cuban shaped sports. So the Crux Sports is based off the size of the sports, four and five eighths by thirty-five. And then the packaging for some of these, they come in the kind of those the kind of the paper wrap packs and like five packs, right? That you guys have for Skeeter Sports, Guild, Bull and Bear, you know, Passport. Was that kind of a you know, what, what, how did that, how did you guys come up with that kind of plan for coming out with those five packs? Well, coming from the retailer standpoint, I mean. Shelf space is a premium. I mean, any humidor in the country, I don't care how big it is, they always want to fit as many cigars as they possibly can. And coming from a place like Minneapolis where you have to have everything enclosed, uh, looking in the humidor, going through, trying to make really Mark and Jeff and trying to design some really, you know, 
beautiful boxes that really stood out, um, going through obviously costs on those things and trying to come up with something that's going to be effective. And realizing when you walk around a humidor, most covers are ripped off, they're turned sideways. So uh, basically what we want to do is we wanted to make the most retail friendly box. So essentially in our box, uh, we have uh, anything 20 count or more uh, comes in what we call five packs, uh, also known as refill packs for us. But what we did is we cellophane everything inside over 33 ring gauge as well as put barcodes on them so you can sell them in three different points. Single, single skew, five pack, or a box price. So you can also display the boxes vertically or horizontally. Uh, so it allows the, uh, the retailer to uh, you know, utilize the shelf space that they have because all we want to do is be on a shelf. And you get some pretty good feedback from the retailers in, in your packaging options? We did. And, th and that's the thing about it is, we, I mean, when you know, it kind of came to us, and, you know, Jeff and Mark in the design factor that, um, you know, it, for them, it was brilliant from the retail side of it. They're like, this is amazing. We could spend all this money on all these beautiful boxes, but what do retailers really need? They want something to display cigars. Um, and retailers specifically in 2014, it made us stand out. Absolutely. They were like, wow, that is, that is, why hasn't anybody done this? Why aren't people thinking about this? And we've actually had a couple uh, manufacturers use some sort of um, different packaging that kind of emulates ours. Um, so that's obviously showing that, you know, people appreciated what we did, but it was, I can guarantee you that there was retailers that picked us up in 14 specifically gave us a shot because of all the thought and planning that went into just our packaging alone. You know, I got it. Sorry, Aaron. Go ahead. Oh, I gotta give you guys credit because at the trade show, you guys have a display and it, IPC Bar Trade Show is what I'm referring to for folks out there, is where you showcase all the new product. Well, Crux put together a display of how that all looks together on a retail shelf. And I, and I just think it was, it was a brilliant move. Not only did it make your booth look good, but it showed basically what – it put into action what you were just talking about. Yeah, exactly. And, and when, I can't remember the exact number because it's years, a few years ago. But when we first came out, we had every size – and it, there wasn't a whole lot of facings. I mean, we came out with six brands – um initially and i want to say it was like 11 facings um it wasn't a ton of sizes in each one um so we had I mean, nymphomaniac had two skeeters classic had three bull and bear had uh two and passport had three um so i mean there's not a lot of but so they could see as a retail they could see exactly how it looked if they at the time they carried everything we had and they could see they could visualize it on their shelf and then 2015 was the year that the the Connoisseur came out, and that was I think I would say kind of a more premium offering than your initial releases. So I'm assuming that was already in the plan that that was you know kind of a couple year into the company that you were going to come out with that kind of a, a product. So to kind of take us through what that was is how you were going to build up brands to, before you got to those that that line. Well, we knew we had a good starting portfolio, something that was you know medium full flavor, very clean finishing. And that was kind of our MO. We want cigars that finish clean. We want them to be full of flavor. And we don't want to necessarily be overpowering. We want cigars that people can smoke one after another. Excuse me. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the Connoisseur is one cigar that Jeff blended that uh, is, is one of our personal favorites as well as Coop's. He enjoyed it as well. Um, but, uh, I mean, we had to set ourselves. I mean, you, ha you, can only ha you have to have a balance of small ring gauge versus to the most popular selling ring gauges in the country. Um, it's, you have to have sellable sizes throughout your entire portfolio. Obviously your 50, 52 ring gauges, uh, and some larger ring gauges are the better selling overall SKUs in the humidor. So we have to have those to build a company to stand on, but we want to be able to continue to serve the underserved markets. And for us, we believe, you know, that's the Lancero population. That's the smaller ring gauge stuff under 40 ring gauges that, that really, um, don't get enough attention. And in cigars, when you have the, the leaf of the tobacco is, is the best tobacco we use. Um, and that's the premium grade A stuff, the most flavorful, the cleanest finishing, the longest fermented. So the wrapper is where everybody spends all this time. Um, so when you have a, a ratio of as much wrapper in under 40 ring gauge cigars, you're going to get a lot of great flavors. And you can have as not a cigar that's as overpowering with a lot of really cool, unique flavors. And that's where the Deconosaur came from. The Deconosaur actually has 60% Lajero, if you didn't know that, Coop. Um, well, I did not realize that till you just said that. It's a 60% Lajero in that cigar, but it's a medium bodied cigar. Um, and, it but, burn, and it burns great. The combustion is unbelievable in this cigar. And, and you have a, a great wrapper. You have great fillers. Um, and 
So continue to serve markets under 40 ring gauges. Obviously, um, building our company on on the largest ring gauge sellers across the humidor. But we want to continue. And when we came out to the connoisseur, I was kind of in love with it from the get-go. And I apologize if we run out of them at any time. I probably smoke most of them. <laughs> Um, because I, I, I absolutely love it. It's, it's, it's my number one go-to currently, but it could change next week. You never know. Um, but, uh, no, uh, yeah. So small ring gauges are definitely a thing at the forefront of our mind. You know, when Paul, Paul Asadurian and I were doing Stogie Geeks, we really came up with this philosophy of, and I think Aaron's embraced it as well, of, you know, every size is really kind of a different cigar. And with that, the connoisseur line it, it is, you have three small Lancero size, One's a little smaller than Lancer, I'd say, but they're all different. And you pointed out, I remember when I met when I saw you in Florida last time, you were pointing out the number three, how it has a little more of that spicy kick to that thing. And, and when you said that, I'm like, yeah, he's right. Very, it's actually a very different cigar. Where you get a little more of that Lajero. Yeah, it's uh, the, uh, the size that he's referring to is the old based off the old Partagas de Connoisseur series, where we try to tie some tribute to another Cuban, Cuban old Cuban company, De Connoisseur. We made our own blend, obviously, use the sizes. Uh, we have a seven and a half by 38, uh, six and a half by 38. And then uh, my go-to generally is the number three. Uh, it's a five and five eighths by 35. And it's a little bit more peppery, a little bit, uh, but it's got that very, very good sweetness that, I mean, I could, and, and I mean, it's a good, it's a good amount of time for me. And how did the uh, Limitada PB5 come about? Well, the PB5 has, um, uh, ben, obviously a great cigar for us. It's got some accolades on, you know, some of the blogs. Um, and the fact is that came about because with Placencia, they have so much great premium tobacco. They're second to none when it comes to the growing and uh, fermenting of the process. So they have a lot of tobacco that has been aging, sitting around that is in smaller quantities that most major manufacturers, you know, can't do a whole lot with. So we actually found this lot of tobacco, this Enganyanso, Engañoso wrapper that we use for the PB5. Um, essentially, there was about 50,000 cigars worth of tobacco. So we took it all, we secured it, we bought it. Um, and, you know, it was a cigar uh, wrapper that when Jeff blended with it the first time, he fell in love with it. And anybody that smoked a PB5 or even the IPCPR edition, uh, it has that same wrapper. And unfortunately, it's a limited wrapper, so it will run out uh, at some point. Um, but that came out because we don't want to be a company that builds off of exclusive limited editions because we want the cigars to be in humidors that people continue to get behind and support. But as a cigar company, we say we always needed a limited edition uh, because, you know, people love the exclusivity, the, the aging of stuff, the kind of the, the squirreling it away, if you may say, and, you know, having these unique boxes, these unique things. So we needed to come out with one, and uh, we finally came out within our second year uh, the first edition, which was the PB5 2015, which we did 500 boxes, 10 count boxes for 5,000 cigars. And, um, you know, it was, it was a cigar that, that did very well for us. And, you know, it's, it sells out every year and we'll, we'll make that cigar in, in, uh, in a, in a yearly release in, in until that tobacco is gone. And you just, yeah, you had your second run of that, uh, cigar earlier this year, right? We did. We had the 2016 edition, uh, which, uh, we did 750 boxes this go around. Uh, because 500 sold out too fast. And what you do with those is pretty special as it, as it was a show exclusive and it wasn't something that a retailer could buy. So can you go go through what, why you guys made that and kind of what the process was for a retailer to actually get it in their shop? So you're, you're talking to the IPCPR versus the PB5? Okay, yeah. so the, the IPCPR edition, um, which is right here, uh, it was a unique box that we did for Vegas show last year. Um, we did the limited edition there. It's called the. It's part of the the uh, the Limitada um, uh, brand, which will have other Limitadas down the road. We had the PB5 first, and then this was the IPCPR show exclusive. And the reason we did a show exclusive is because, I mean, we really uh, appreciate coming from our retail background, um, the retailers supporting the manufacturers at the IPCPR trade show. I mean, like it's a crucial part of our industry. Um, so we wanted obviously to give some incentive for them to show up at our booth, to, to come to the show and do something that was obviously tied into where it was with this cover of this box. As you can see, it has, you know, that sign is, is, is resembling the, uh, the old Vegas sign, um, that Mark came up with, which is a beautiful design by him. And so we wanted to do something pretty unique, pretty different 
that we wanted to say, hey, you know, we appreciate you guys coming out and supporting us here uh, because we appreciate it as manufacturers, the support of our retailers. And Casey, that IPCPR cigar, that's using, that's also using the same wrapper, right? Same wrapper. Um, same wrapper, a little bit tweaked on the inside, not quite the same as the PB5, uh, but it's the same wrapper, correct? And on that one, we did make that a different size, completely different size. Uh, this is a fi- uh, 5x52 with the uh, bar- uh, box press marble head. Yeah, I love how you incorporated that marble head, which I think is something that's become a signature of a lot of Crux cigars into the Limitado line. I thought that was, that was great. Well, the marble head isn't on the PB5. No, but I mean on on the on one of your limiteds, I said. Okay. It, yeah. It, yeah. Now the bl- the blends are the blends. How are the blends? Are they different blends? Are they optimized to the size? Would you say? Um, the PB five has. Um, the, I mean the the, fi- the obviously same wrapper. Uh, we had to tweak, make a little change in the uh, IPCPR because we didn't want it to be the same cigar. Uh, we didn't want it to be the same. We wanted to try something a little bit different. Uh, so it isn't quite the same. It's similar, uh, but it's a different cigar completely because uh, Jeff did a tweak in uh, some of the fillers. Right, and that's yeah, that's what I'm saying. You could do, do a different size, a tweak here, and then suddenly it's a it's a different experience. You know, it's a, which is what I love about cigars. Yeah, exactly. You can you can you could I mean, you can have different sizes and changing the ratios, and you know, with with different percentage of fillers. I mean you could have a completely different cigar when you change in Lajeros or Visos or Seikos. I mean, you can totally move the different flavors of cigars just by changing percentages. This is episode one of the primetime show. Will Cooper and Amon Loomis here. We're talking with Casey Hogan of Crux Cigar Company. So, Aaron, in this cigar we were just talking about, the IPCPR, this made it to the top of your rankings. Yeah, I thought it was a fantastic cigar. And usually for me, when I – when I, you know, I get my number one cigar of the year, it's really something that stands out, you know, among the other ones. Um, and typically for me, it's, uh, it's really full flavors, um, which that cigar has, um, but it also has some nuances to it. So um, you can really enjoy it kind of in two different areas. One is, you know, you're smoking alone, you're really be able to focus on the cigar, you can find those nuances in there. But also if you're smoking the cigar when you're, you know, hanging out with friends or doing whatever, um, the flavor is so full that, you know, it's, it's up in the forefront for you. Like, even if you're not paying attention to it, it's still hitting you. So it's there. So, you know, you have different ways to, to get that. But, um, the other thing is that it just continues on throughout the, throughout the cigar. So what I tend to find is if, if a cigar is fairly linear, um, I don't taste it as much as the cigar goes along. You know, you kind of have that same flavor. It, you know, you, it starts dropping off for you and then it kind of just tapers out as the cigar goes along. This one doesn't really do that. It kind of, it kind of builds on itself and kind of keeps that flavor for you and um, you never get really tired of it. So that was one of the things I really appreciate about the cigar and construction's fantastic as are in all the cruxes. I think one of the things I think about when they, when doing all the small ring gauge stuff is that's, you don't have a lot of room for error in that, in that scenario. So if you have bad construction on the small ring gauge stuff, you're going to run into some problems. So, they really nailed it with all that, and I'm sure Plensensi has a lot to do with that, but um, it just kind of goes along with all the different lines they have. Yeah, they really do. They do a great job for us. I mean, we have um, our own people that do our own rolling, our own bunching, uh, especially with our small ring gauges because uh, we are pretty unique where we have some of the only size cigars that are rolled in that factory. Like the Nymphomaniac, we have one pair um, that rolls that cigar for us, that, and that's all they do is roll Nymphomaniacs. Um, so – we want to keep our consistency very, very high. We have, we want to fa- try to keep that failure rate under one percent. Um, so, which we do with the information, which we do with all our cigars now, which is, you know, really excited about that. But no, they do a great job, um, as as well as staying, being a part of it, making sure we're all working together, knowing what we really want. Um, and you know, they have the right people down there that you know have really made us essentially a uh, vertical company uh, internally with them because we have all our own people there that that work in their factory. Um, but, uh, basically they're the brick and mortar down there. And, you know, we, they are basically family to us with their tobacco, with their people, with their hospitality. Um, just everything they've done for, for Crux as a whole has, has been absolutely fantastic. You know, Casey, you guys don't get the credit for the construction of these cigars. I, I mean, I'm glad this was brought up because I have not had, I, I can't, I can't say I've had construction problems on these cigars. I mean, if, if there was one or two, it's, 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 a, it's, it's the normal case. 
So, I mean, there's been incredible I mean, quality control. Are you guys involved with the quality control aspects? Uh, or you work 100% with- hands on. Yeah, 100% hands on. Yeah, I, I mean, we have, we have great people that obviously weren't trained by me, um, but <laughs> that are not, first and foremost, as well as during every production run, I go down um, and I oversee everything that's being packed. I am there for the production of the cigars. I'm there for the packaging of the cigars. Um, because you know, it, it's, it's, when it comes to it, if you, you put a bad or a not perfect drawing cigar in your mouth and you know, first impressions are internal and you know, we're still such a young company that we want to create crux smokers instead of, you know, create crux triers. We want crux smokers. So, um, no, absolutely 100% hands on. They do their due diligence and they're great and they know exactly what our expectations are, which we have high expectations. I mean, like the American market has such a high standard of quality that people will realize that, you know, when you smoke cigars from, you know, the major uh, importing cigar countries in, in, uh, into the United States, you'll realize that that quality level is, is, is extremely high. That's because the American market expects that. So we expect, we want to expect higher than our consumers and we want to be able to, uh, you know, give that to our, our smokers. So no, we have all of our people. And then at that point, you know, I mean, we definitely do a check. I mean, we go through, you know, physical touch through draw testing through, you know, even the smoking of cigars right off the table uh, for every production. And, you know, the, the, the uh, fortune, the, the connoisseur that I like to smoke um, is a very difficult cigar to make at 35 ring gauge um, or a 38 ring gauge. I mean, as long as they are, but we have some great pairs that, that do those couple of cigars for us. And, you know, they do a great job and, and we're, we're so pleased to have them on our team. No, absolutely. You know, Seth Geis, who's Aaron's partner on one of the contributors to Developing Palettes, we were talking and we had this conversation and we're going to mention FDA in a second, but, you know, because FDA obviously is making your life difficult, but, but you know, he said to me something and it, it's resonated with me. If you guys would have launched in 2006, right, <laughs> where would you guys be? I, the sky would be the limit right now where you guys would be because – I'm well, I was a little young. I was still in college. Right, right. And, I was, I, and in 2006, I was, I still was, uh, you know, playing college athletics and you know, drinking a little more than I should and you know, doing doing a lot of fun living as a you know, a 21 year old kid. So, yeah, no, but but yeah, I mean, so obviously you got you have a, a big portfolio. Are you guys ready to tackle the FDA now? Because you know, everyone's like, you got all these lines, they're great lines. Are we going to continue to see him is the question. Of course. And absolutely. I mean, that's a great question. I love, I love uh, having the opportunity to talk about that now because um, the FDA has been a, has been a big obstacle over our industry over the last, right. uh, whenever it was initially announced, but essentially since uh, with the last year, because preparing for the August 8th deadline. Um, and then, so essentially um, as a small company that has nothing uh, before the, uh, the 2008, the, the 2008 mark, um, you know, we aligned ourselves with the Placencia factory, uh, which um, has tobacco that has been imported since before uh, 2008. So, I mean, we have aligned ourselves with partners that um, are going to give us the versatility to apply for substantial equivalent, um, as well as we imported, you know, and sold and had to, and that's some of the, and marketed a lot of the releases uh, before 2008 that under the FDA guidelines, what we need to do is import SKUs, market them, sell them across the country. And, and we did that as a company. So, you know, we, we've aligned ourselves in about as good a situation as any company post 2008 that's new to the market uh, that could. I mean, we feel we've done a great job uh, setting ourselves up for success over the course of the, uh, of the future. Um, we'll be around. I have no ifs, ands, or buts about this. This isn't my part-time job. This isn't you know, this isn't what we do as a part-time thing. This isn't a hobby. This is what we do for our livelihood. So we've been around uh, on the market for a few years, but, you know, it's been a plan. It's been a process. And we're very, very confident for the, the effort that we put in to set up for the FDA. Um, and, you know, who knows what's going to happen? We still don't know exactly what that's going to be. But for the guidelines that we've been given, we have done about as good as you could possibly do is putting ourselves in position to succeed. Casey, we're, we're heading, I guess we have five more minutes. Um, so we've got a couple more questions. Um, Epicure um, announced at the trade show last year. What's the status of Epicure? When, when can we expect to see that? Well, the Epicure is a cigar. I mean, like we had all of the, you know, we get, we brought a lot of things in and had to announce a lot of stuff in 2016 
because of what we were just talking about with the FDA. And the Epicure would have been the forefront had there been no FDA. Um, so the Epicure is going to be our next release. It is coming. It is close. Like I tell people, we don't want to put a cigar that we don't find is 100% ready. And, you know, with the setbacks that we had through the whole entire FDA, you know, it wasn't just up to 2000 or uh, till August 8th. You know, there was manufacturer side. We had a lot of things we had to get taken care of. Uh, so from the manufacturer side, there was a lot going on. But Epicure's coming soon. I'm not going to give you a quite a deadline because it has to be perfect. It has to be ready. Um, it's, I mean, because for us, it's an Ecuadorian Connecticut wrapper um, that, you know, we haven't come to the market with yet. So for us, it has to be perfect uh, because an Ecuadorian is, excuse me, uh, Connecticut is, you know, the number one selling wrapper in the world. Um, and we need ours to be uniquely different. And I feel like that cigar is fantastic. I'm really excited about it. It's aging properly. Um, but it isn't something we're just going to say, let's rush it out. It's already been marketed. It's already been brought to, brought to, um, brought to the country under the FDA guidelines on the scales that were necessary. Um, but then bringing it out to the mass markets throughout the entire, uh, entire country, uh, that was just a lot more tobacco, a lot more, a lot more things that we had to secure. Um, but that hasn't been taken care of. And so Epicure is coming, I promise. I'm excited about it. It's a Connecticut cigar with a Super Lajero filler that's going to give a really good uh, spice for the retro hail. And it'll be a unique, it'll be a unique Connecticut. Uh, and it'll be a part of our portfolio that we uh, are missing in the Crux portfolio. So Casey, outside of cigars, what takes up your time? What takes up my time? Well, I travel with cigars. So other than the traveling part of that, uh, my, per my personal interests, um, I mean, I live in South Florida, so the weather is always really hot, humid, and beautiful. There's sun every day, and it rains every day, so you can go. I, I spend a lot of time, uh, you know, at the, the state park. I do kayaking at the beach, you know. Uh, but really, truthfully, if any time I can find the time, I'm going to go play golf. To me, golf is my number one passion outside of cigars. So what are your thoughts on the, uh, how the Masters finished up this year? Well, it was a great finish. It was a great finish. I was accepting the outcome. Um, Sergio, who had never won, uh, for people that aren't listening, Sergio Garcia had never won a major, and he's, I believe he's in his late 30s, 70-some-odd uh, tournaments, majors that he played in and never won. Um, but I tend to cheer for Americans first. <laughs> and I kind of have this, uh, this, arc or, this hierarchy of my favorite guys. In golf, you don't really cheer against people. It's kind of looked down upon. We right. all have a few guys we, we kind of, you know, cheer when they miss a putt or yank and, you know, pull a drive. But Sergio's kind of been a brat over his life. But, yeah. but he's grown substantially over the last few years. He's become one of the guys. He's been on Ryder Cup teams. He's been accepting by his peers. And when it came down to the end, him battling out Rose was fine with me because Rose has already done it. Sergio hadn't. And at least he didn't beat an American down the stretch. Right. I I uh I miss Jack Nicholas and Tom Watson. We were talking, <laughs> we were talking before the show. <laughs> and a little, we had a little bit of a hot topic debate before the show. <laughs> uh, well, I, oh, we got to get you back into baseball. Yeah, yeah, Casey. Uh, predictions for baseball this year. Who do you think? The Twins are going to win it again. Yeah. You know, I really want to see Paul Molitor do well. I mean, the Twins are going to win it again. I mean, I was at the '91 World Series Game Seven. I was there, sitting in the right, left field bleacher. Greatest Greatest baseball game I ever watched. Game six, when I fell asleep, and I was I was seven years old. I fell asleep in game six, and Kirby, game Puck, seven. Kirby Puckett hit that home run. Game seven, one nothing. Jack Morris on the hill. Those are my Ten twins. Innings. Ten innings. I was there. I was still awake. I was still awake. Uh, was, I mean, I was um, I was a uh, newlywed. I had just gotten married, and I think my wife was watching the game with me, and she wouldn't stay up that night. I was in left center field bleachers, just so you know. Wow! Wow! I, I, uh, yes. Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, Casey, uh, always, a, always a pleasure. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, you're welcome to stick around. As you said, we're going to get into a couple of other areas. Uh, we're going to talk about the connoisseur a little more, which was our smoke of the week as well. Yeah, I'm here, guys. Again, appreciate you having me on the inaugural show. I mean, you guys are two very brilliant people in in the, in our industry, and we appreciate everything you guys do. I mean, you guys don't get enough credit as bloggers, as as media personnel. I mean, we appreciate you guys because it helps. It helps uh, educate people on on our history, on our brand, and uh, you know, you know, Aaron Coop, uh, you guys have been nothing but spectacular for you know for our company, and 
as long as Aaron can uh, describe that uh, that rating system to the rest of the world, uh, then, <laughs> then, then, then people will actually believe that you know the whatever the number that he gave it was. Um, but I've I've been I've been uh, I've been uh, I've been schooled three times now, and I think I have a handle of his rating system. But I'll probably ask for a fourth edition here shortly. I'm gonna add another uh, wrinkle so that you you're, you don't you're not as comfortable as you think you are. <laughs> well, I'm just gonna go off the fact is he's doing something unique and different, which is great to see. Some people thinking a little different. However, you know, at one point it's it's gonna piss everybody off, and you know he's gonna have yep. to take a lot of phone calls like he took seven of mine. <laughs> um, so we appreciate you guys. You guys do a lot for our industry. That that goes. Uh, you know, uncredited to you guys, but we really appreciate everything you do. And again, thank you for the Deconnoisseur and the IPCPR number one nods for 2016. You know, it's an honor. We really appreciate it. From all of us at Crux, thank you guys. Yeah, thank you, Casey. Okay, with that, we'll just uh, we'll hear a couple words from our sponsors here. Uh, JRE Tobacco. The authentic Corojo leaf is one of the most robust and flavorful tobacco leaves out there. During the golden age of cigars in Cuba, it was the leaf of choice to make some of the world's greatest cigars. Because it is one of the most challenging ones to cultivate, it fell out of favor by the 1990s. In the Hamastron Valley in Honduras, Julio R. Aroa took on the challenge of growing Corojo from the original seeds. And in 2000, he successfully introduced Corojo back into the market. With 50 years' experience in the tobacco business, from growing and curing tobacco to production, the Aroa Tobacco Farm has been able to continue to deliver products with authentic Corojo. And now with JRE Tobacco, Julio and his son Justo bring their very own brand to market, each containing the authentic Corojo leaf. Tadascan offers a mild to medium in both a Connecticut and Habano wrapper. Rancho Lunar is a premium medium cigar available in Habano and Maduro. And Aladino is a 100% authentic Corojo Puro representing that golden age of cigars from 1947 to 1961. Now available at your local retailer, be sure to ask for JRE Tobacco, a legacy that is tasted in every drawer. And by Cornelius and Anthony. If you are going to be wanted for something, be wanted for something great. That's what Cornelius Bailey set out to do five generations ago, and that's what Stephen Bailey is doing with Cornelius and Anthony Cigars. Using the finest tobaccos, Cornelius and Anthony brings you the Daddy Mac, Venganza, Meridian, and Cornelius. Find them at your local tobacconist. Welcome back. Um, so we're going to get into uh, – we're gonna. I'm going to announce a new segment here, and um, – as the uh, primetime podcast was formed, uh, you know, the, first of all, I want to just thank everybody um, who tuned in and just has supported us uh, in the launch of this effort. Uh, it's it's been the the feedback's been unbelievable. I know there's been some questions in the uh, the chat room, uh, a chat room, but actually on Facebook, we got to get a chat room actually going. We are gonna have a Facebook live thing, so I just want to let folks know that, but. As the show was being launched, um, I actually got a uh, – I was contacted by Phil Zengi of uh, Debonair Cigars. And he goes, hey, I want to be a part of the Coop podcast. And uh, he has um, – he is bringing the Debonair Ideal segment to the primetime show. So we're real excited to have the Debonair Ideal segment. And I'll just kind of talk a little about, uh, about the Debonair Ideal segment because it really stems from what Phil and Phil's going to be sponsoring that segment, obviously with that name, Phil runs a uh, debonair house, which is his brands out of the Dominican Republic. He uses the Reyes family and kind of like as Casey just said, he's got his own people in the factory doing things. And he also uses those people for other brands. And really what he's tried to do with debonair is he's brought that whole gentlemanly thing into the equation. Um, and he really, it, and I've gotten to know Phil, he doesn't just um, believe this you know, gentleman. It's something he preaches. But he also really looks for cigars to be these conduits to other things in, in life. So you, this is the type of things we'll be discussing on Debonair Ideal, which will be um, the every, you know, these everyday things, how cigars just it, – it's, yes, it's more of a cigar lifestyle thing. We'll try to keep an industry focused as much as possible. Um, but you know, and Phil's even done that with one of his sub brands, which is India Motorcycle Cigars, which he has um brought a uh, you know, that whole connecting the Indian motorcycle style to um cigars. One of our sponsors is the cigar shop, which I'll talk a little about in a bit, but 
they uh, they're right across the street from a motorcycle dealer, and it's in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And I was down there, and I see that I see these motorcycle people love cigars. Mm -hmm. So we're really glad to have we're very glad and fortunate to have that. And Aaron, I know I've been babbling on. I don't know if you have anything to say on that. No, I think I, I agree with it. I mean, kind of that debonair lifestyle is kind of like a, a lost art. So I think, um, you know, being able to bring that back and uh, kind of uh, have those topics that we can talk about will be uh, something something nice to be able to share with people. Yeah, yeah. And I, like I said, I think it will be uh, – there will be some unique things. I know, you know, you know um, Phil's always thinking that – and when Phil's on, there will be a boxing segment. Uh, I'm just warning everyone. <laughs> of course. That may be the week you're not doing the show, Aaron. <laughs> I know, but it's up to you. But there will be a boxing segment with Phil Zengi. I can assure you. You know, someone told me there's a video. I think it was Jonathan Drew told me this because because we were talking about yeah. You know, obviously, uh, Drew Estate distributes Debonair, and there's a. I guess Phil is big into boxing, and he goes into the corners of a lot of these fighters. And I guess there's a video that Drew said is around where. Zengi is in someone's corner, and I don't know who the fighter was, but the fighter wins the fight. It was a TV fight, and there's a picture of like little Phil Zengi bouncing around <laughs> the ring, like after the fight. You know, I, I got, I said, you got to find me that video, Jonathan. So, but apparently there is something out there with that. I have to do a little bit of searching. Yeah, yeah. Um. So yeah, we'll have some we'll have some various topics uh, on that in the uh, you know upcoming weeks on um on the IQ next week you'll we'll have a fresh segment. So if folks have something they want to talk about, again just uh you know email uh, coop at uh, coop at cigar hyphen coop dot com. And you know it's interesting because even when, when I was talking to Casey, obviously we we bonded and connected that day in his office. So it was just mm -hmm. like an everyday conversation with that. Right. Yep. Um. So, uh, yeah, we'll look forward to that. And we want to thank Phil again for his support on, on end. I'm sure Phil will be on the show at some point um, as we launch the, uh, the first uh, of the Debonair Ideal on the primetime show. Uh, real quick for, again, kind of talking about Debonair Ideal and conduits, connections to things. Cigar Coop Challenge Coin, password. Uh, I, I mentioned the password at the beginning of the show. This is not... This is not counting. I'm going to repeat the password. You have to know when it's said in a, in a conversation, 2011. So this is not counting for the contest, but 2011 is the password. Um, I was shocked how these challenge coins, Aaron, I'm, I'm, people, I gave a few of these out, and I've seen people put them online, and I never yeah. did thought I'd see this. I'm like, what? And, and, and you know, Stogie Santa um, calls me. He goes, where did you come up with that idea? Right. I'm like, it was, it was my cousin, actually, Andrew Columbia, uh, my brother from another mother. I'll say, great guy. He's selling them. He, he brought, the, he said, hey, I got an idea for you. You know, he knew about like, you know, possibly looking at some marketing. He goes, what would you think about this? I said, I thought about him. Like, yeah, he worked it. So uh, Northwest Mint did these coins and uh, they are giveaways. They are not going to be for sale. So yeah, they're very nice. They're very uh, heavy as well. So I wanted to try to win that. Did you get? I gotta get you one. I gotta get you one of these coins, yeah, Casey. But yeah, and of course, it has our, our philosophy: rumor free, teaser free. <laughs> the only debonair, the, the way we don't report rumors and teasers. So um, it's 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 funny. That's that's been my mantra for years. And then now I, I'm mad I didn't think of the name fake news. That's <laughs> I wish I would have thought of fake news <laughs> earlier on. So so uh, yeah. All right. Um, so, uh, what I'd like to do is move into our, our cigar of the week talk real quick. And, um, the cigar of the week segment is brought to you by the, the cigar shop and the cigar shop is the, has the best in premium handmade cigars. Visit their locations in Monroe, North Carolina, and now South Carolina's largest walking humidor in Myrtle beach, South Carolina. You can find them on the web at www.cigarshop.com. And, uh, anyway, so I, uh, this week, um, I guess I I guess I pulled rank over you, Aaron. I apologize. Crux the connoisseur. Uh, no worries. Yeah, thoughts on the cigar? What are your thoughts about it? I really dig the cigar. I mean, I liked it when uh, Casey gave it to me at the trade show in in 2015. Um, it, I like Lancero. Um, it's very nuanced. Uh, I'd say wood is the primary note on the cigar. Um, you get a nice aged wood note, but uh, a lot of nuance to it. Um, it's really, it's really enjoyable. I think it's definitely a, a you know, kind of sort of cigar. Definitely agree. So 
I had this cigar when I the first time I smoked it was actually late in two. I was October. I'm sorry, September 2015. I thought it was a really good cigar. Um, I went back and smoked this cigar about a few weeks before the trade show, and I it went from a great cigar in my book to at this epic level, where I'm like, wow, this is this is the best cigar I've had this year, mm -hmm. and um, I, I and I'm I am not. I am not a Lancero guy. It, it just happened I had two a, Lanceros that were one, two, <laughs> which exactly. is very, which is very rare for me, Casey. Um, <laughs> which I, I'm okay with it. We'll make yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it was like you know when I was on Stogie Geeks, I made this statement once saying I hate Mexican rapper, which was like the dumbest thing I ever said because I found all these cigars I like Mexican rapper on, <laughs> right. right? So you know, again, but when you get a blend, we get a blend like yours that was this was something. Blended this is a to, Mexican rapper. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, it went to the and, and so you know, age is something I love doing to a cigar. And these you could just put away, and you you can smoke them now, and they're great. And you put them away, they they age better. So um, I, I think Let's you said, but smoke them now. Smoke them yeah. now. Uh, and we'll make more. Right, right. That's the idea. Smoke buy a them box now. to smoke now, and buy a box to store away. Right. Yeah. Continue to smoke them one a day. <laughs> right. Um, in my opinion. It's one of the greatest 38 ring gig cigars I've ever had. Um, I, I love that. You're welcome. I love the fact that this is a six and a half as opposed. I like that there's a little on this particular ring. I like that it's a little shorter. Sometimes when you go above, when you get to seven, seven and a half, I find the cigar will run out of gas. Yeah, but, I agree. Yeah. So I know I like the size. I know Eddie Ortega used to do his Lanceros in this size too. Um, so I, I, I like that as well. And, um, yeah, I agree. There's, there's some great woody notes in this cigar. Um, I get like that a little bit. I get a little bit of a coffee note. I get a little bit of red pepper as well. And like Casey's, we talked about earlier, each of the three sizes are very different. Yeah. And so, it's surprising. And it's surprising because of the three sizes, because two of them have the same ring gauge. Yeah. Uh, but you add that extra inch to the number one and it truly tastes it has a different experience. Yeah. No, and I, I, I agree. I agree. And and those other sizes, I mean, I haven't done, a, like I'd say, the formal coupe assessment on it, but they're, they're very close, too. So um, I've kind of leaned a little more towards the number two. Well, keep Kate, smoking, Coop. Keep yeah. <laughs> but, but Casey, when, I, when he gave me, you know, I kind of – the number three was the one I ignored the most of, of the line. I, I see what Casey's saying about that. That three is really – it's really special. It's a, uh, that, uh, well, I apologize it, when we run out because I smoked them. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's now these don't come in the five packs, correct? No, they don't. We don't do five packs and things that are uh, ten count boxes. It's okay, kind of, that would if it's uh, if it's twenty or more count boxes, we do five packs. Um, if it's under twenty count, um, usually they're uh, single stack ten, ten by one count boxes. Yep, yep. So uh, yeah, so like I said, this was final thoughts. I think God, everyone knows my opinion on this cigar. Um, if you haven't smoked this cigar, I encourage you, uh, if you could find any before Casey gets before I get them off the shelf. Crookcigars.com. You go to our retail page. Uh, there's all of our retailers. There. There's a few places that are online as well that if you're not in, near one of our retailers, uh, they'll get it to you. But, yeah, Crookcigars.com. Um, you can find all of our retail partners uh, yeah. that, that probably support Crook Cigars. Yeah, we have a we have a buddy, uh, one of our list, uh, viewers, Bill says his name is Cruck, right? He's he's by the way, he's gonna sue you, he said, for Crux, right? <laughs> but his nickname is Cruck, and he was actually asking there was a question that came up, he had pointed out to me that where you could buy the cigar, so in North Carolina. So I think you can look on uh, the retail page is the answer and get Yeah, that. go to the retail page. Uh, there's a tab on the top. Uh, it says uh, I believe it says partners, um, and that'll take you where to buy it. Listed by state as well as there's some online avenues. Uh, in case you're not listed near one of those retailers, support your brick and mortars, uh, of course. Um, but yeah, that's they're always uh, they'll be located there. As well as there's a story, there's the information behind all of our products, um, and you can kind of see a little bit of the history, a little bit of the the blend. Obviously, all the available sizes that we make. Not that maybe every retailer carries, but that we do make. Um, um, so there's a lot of information on that. So check out www.cruxcigars.com uh, for any of that information. Thank you, Casey. Aaron, any final thoughts? No, just great cigar. I definitely recommend picking some up. Excellent, excellent. All right, well, we will take a quick break uh, for a couple of commercial sponsors. We'll get into our final segment.
the Hot Topics segment. Uh, this segment is sponsored by M. Bombay Cigars. M. Bombay Cigars represent the most admired cigar culture of Cuba. They select the best of the best quality tobacco to use in the aging process. M. Bombay Cigars are then rolled in Costa Rica by some of the most experienced cigar rollers, giving it a unique experience. The band portrays the detailed and artistic nature of our small industry. Try the M. Bombay line and the new Gaia line. M. Bombay Cigars, where the cigar is a way of life. And by Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust. With Dumbarton Tobacco and Trust, master blender Steve Saka set out to create Puro Son Compromiso, cigars without compromise. This represents an expression of Saka's closely held values and a test in three simple words everything Saka wants to accomplish. Cigars are more than a passion to Saka. They are a way of life. Ask for the brands of Dumbarton Tobacco and Trust, Sobra Mesa, Mi Carita, Umbagog, and Muestra de Saka at your local tobacconist. So uh, Will Cooper here, Aaron Loomis, uh, Casey Hogan was our special guest tonight. We are now into, uh, I think what is going to be our signature, but outside the interview is going to be really our, one of our signature things, which I don't think any other show has done on a regular basis, and that is the Hot Topic segment. So Aaron, oh, I guess this is the segment where I, I know we say all the good things in Debonair, and then we just we basically are going <laughs> to go downhill now. Exactly. Right, right. So, knows. so this is uh, so I will say the the words uh, Aaron and I are going to say do not reflect our guests or our sponsors or anything like that. They're our own. So <laughs> correct, correct. <laughs> Any, anything that these two say over the next few minutes uh, are not are not uh, um, satisfied or under the laws of Crux Cigar Company. They have their own opinions. They're their own gentlemen. Right. So, <laughs> so the topic tonight is. Uh, TAA cigars. Uh, they're the Tobacconist Association of America. Uh, they're a group, I would say, are about 70 to 80 of uh, retailers around the country. They're, 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 I would say retailers who have been in business for a while. They are retailers with significant buying power, and they've kind of banded together. Uh, they formed an organization. It's not a policymaking organization. And, and Aaron, you can correct me if I'm wrong. It, it is more of a, a, of a I want to say it's more of a club. I don't mm. want to. I don't want to say it's a party club, even though they have a big convention. But, <laughs> but no, I, I mean, so Paul, I, I do understand the, the idea is to kind of learn from each other, get some best practices with it. I think right. that's a great concept. As of, over the years, they've evolved. Mm. They've come out with these exclusive cigars for the TAA, um, and I I was really introduced to them probably about ten years ago, and ten years ago it used to be I think. They used to get one or two maybe manufacturers. They'd come to the table, and they would be selected to release this year's TAA cigar. And there were some really good ones. I mean, there's one, Aaron. I don't think I don't know if you ever had it. The Fonseca Signature Series, no. 2008 release. It was done by Fonseca. It was like a powerhouse Fonseca, which is known for <laughs> my, which is known for mild cigars. Right. Unique cigar, something brought to the table incredible rocky patel did a signature series cigar i think it was 2009 it, it was a very good cigar he did uh, had this had that copper banding on it from what i understand but things have changed okay and in what i've heard is the taa was struggling with some of these cigars and they they were kind of i guess they needed some sort of a boost and that, they kind of got that boost by accident in 2011 with um tatuaje mm -hmm. the tatuaje ta cigar and that cigar just blew up and it put taa on the map and what's happened is this is now grown into not just one or two cigars a year but like since 2011 onward it has become this series where last year there were 17 cigars in the series right 10 or 11 of them were limited releases. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be told, I, I used to look forward to the TAA cigars. I'm going to be totally honest here. I almost don't want to cover the TAA cigars anymore. Right. And, and I'm very frustrated about that. Yeah. I don't think they're, as, they're not as special anymore. They are not. Now, here's a question I have for you, Aaron, and we'll get into that. And then I'll get into why I don't want to cover them anymore on top of that. It has nothing to do with the fact that they've lost. They, I, there have been two TAA cigars since that 2011 
Tatawahe that have had, I'd say, the um, the boost. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's that and Crown Heads. I think it's fair to say whether you like the cigars or not, those are the memorable cigars. Yeah, I'd agree with you. Those two, and I think maybe uh, La Flor Dominicana kind of pops in here and there with with some of theirs as well. Yeah, but can you can anyone name another one that's just like like people have just captured? I, I haven't seen that. No. I don't think so. I think it's just kind of they're just they're limited to be limited, and that's kind of the, supposed to be the draw for the cigar. It's not the cigar itself. It, it, it's it's, and I don't like I said there. I think when you open this up, I I think bringing your best foot forward with the release has suddenly. And look, I I love a lot of these TA retails. I'm not picking on anyone. But I, I, I would just be if I'm a person and I'm, I'm, I'm doing this like with these TA cigars. There's a buy-in like this, from what I said. You got to do a buy-in, and I'm seeing some of the cigars that are coming to the table. And I'm not going to single out. I'm going to get in the more sure if I single out the names there. But honestly, I'm like, real, this is what you're bring. This is the best foot forward you're bringing to the table because right now, right. what I'm seeing, I'm seeing stuff that just didn't make the cut. Is what I'm saying. I'm not yeah. seeing epic cigars like we've been talking about like like and there are i don't this is not the pick i'm not gonna there are some that have been very good but i don't see i see cigars that well maybe we tried this and we put a different wrapper on it or we made a different size of it it didn't work well, let's give it to the taa yeah they'll, they'll figure out what to do with it right and and, and that's just like and, and it's just that's what it is yeah, and I think some of the brands do it where they actually like, hand out various Vitolas to the retailers and they smoke them and they vote on which one that they think is the best one. And then whatever comes out on top is what the retailers that buy and get. They don't even they don't get the choice as to what Vitola they want. They say, all right, this is the one you guys all voted on. This is the one we're doing. You, This is what you get because everybody else said so. Yeah, kind and uh, no, exactly. And the floor has done that. Yeah. Now, I like that they did that. I kind of think it's it brought something a little different to the table. But here's the problem I have with it. Those cigars then were released like a few weeks later. Right. Uh, at all minutes, you know, so that's where I'm going. If, if this was something under development for the TAA, it, it clearly wasn't. I mean, and it may have been a great cigar at LaFleur, but to me, that's not this. I don't know. If, if I owned a cigar company... I don't know, maybe I don't, if I had, the, and I'm certain if I had, this would be something I'd want to invest a lot of research because this used to be getting the best of the best cigars. And, and now I'm not seeing that anymore. Yeah. And to go along with limiteds, I mean, and this isn't necessarily, you know, just with the TAA, but limited as, as a concept, typically to me, it should be something special. It shouldn't just be, um, you know, a regular everyday cigar that you have in limited quantity. I know that's part of the draw to get people to buy it. They think that it's special just because there's a limited quantity or you can only get it from certain retailers. But, you know, you're kind of doing a bit of a disservice because if you keep doing that, what tends to happen is that you kind of kill the series because everybody's like, well, you know, fool me once, I'll try it again. And then after that, I'm kind of out and then you not, you may be losing a bunch of people that, you know, would normally go for those cigars if they were at the quality that you expect from a limited. So that was also kind of a, a testament to crux is their limitadas have been very good. So and, and you know, been, get a, get a crux in the TAA, do it at the level that they've done it. And now you got a winner, but well, if you just kind of put out, just, if you just put out a, you know, just put out a, a you know, an everyday cigar, it's, I don't, I just don't see the draw to it. Right, you know, again, if you're if you come to the TAA and I got this wrapper, right, and I'm bringing this to the TAA and saying, look, you guys are my best retailers in the country, right? I want you guys, you 80 retailers, to buy X number of box. I'm gonna make X number of boxes available to you, and I want you guys to sell that cigar. To me, that's what I would see want the TAA to do. I'd want to have my best of the best retailers and bring my best of the best because that I only have a finite quality with, and that's what I'd want to have. As far as um, it it goes, right. So, so and, but the, the hard part about that from the manufacturing side is, I mean, you're dealing with, I mean, I don't know all the TAA members from the manufacturer side as well as as the retailer side, but there's a good number of, and they're mostly predominantly the major major companies. And the the problem for that is they want to bring something that they do believe is probably a great cigar, something unique, um, but. The point is that they want to also be able to service, you know, the entire industry. So when they do these unique cigars for them, I mean, at their level of 80 retailers, whatever X amount of boxes, I mean, they do 
believe that their coming was something that is unique and different. And, you know, we all have the eyes of the beholder. We all have our own opinion. Um, so mm -hmm. you have, you let those people smoke those cigars and, you know, I've smoked some great TAA. Like I do seek out a few of them. And like you mentioned, I, I, I really do enjoy trying, you know, the Tatuaje TAA every year. I mean, I'm a big Tatuaje fan. Um, they make some of the greatest cigars in the world. Um, but you know, there's, there's other ones that I'm willing to try. And when you see them, even as a manufacturer, like I'm interested to see these great unique things that they do, but then they also have to protect the whole fact that they have to stay true to who they are and create something that's, that's, that's worthy of to put their name on it. Absolutely. Casey, Will Will Cooper, uh, Aaron Loomis, Casey Hogan here. We're uh, on the primetime show. We're on a hot topic segment talking about the TAA and you know, Casey, that, that is a valid, valid point you make yet. Yeah, you know, from that point of view, I can definitely see that. I've, um, I've had another frustration level and with the TA releases, I, you can't get information on these, on these cigars. Okay. <laughs> and, you cannot, you, and, and here's the thing. If I'm, if I'm buying 10 of these cigars I, and I'm owning a retail shop, I want to, I want to tell my customers, this is the story behind the cigar. I'm not saying you have to say, here's the blend and blah, blah, blah. But it's like, no, they go, they have this TAA convention. Nothing comes out in these cigars. I have to go through hoops to get this information. You would think I'm, I'm asking for the keys to Fort Knox here. Hey, what's this cigar about? You know, what's the count box? What's going to be priced? Uh, nothing, right? They don't talk about it. I, I don't even think they talk. I haven't even seen aficionado talk about this year's releases, right? Yeah. I, and here's the thing. Here's why I'm going to criticize the TAA on this. I Googled some of the 2014 TAA cigars to see if I can buy them online. Mm -hmm. And most of them, with the exception of Tatawahe and Crowned Heads, I was able to find. Right. If these cigars are still sitting on your shelf two years, I think you got to do something to market these cigars. And to me, I'm debating, do I want to any more cover TAA cigars and, or instead take that energy and cover things that want to be covered? I don't – if someone's a manufacturer out there who's making TAA cigars and they want to come on the show and, and explain this to me, please do. Because I just, I just don't get it. <laughs> well, I know we do know that they have a great time at TAA. Yes. We do right. know that I would love to be a part of TAA strictly for the experience of what goes on at TAA. Because <laughs> yeah. I've heard a lot of stories, and I'm very envious of a lot of things. We try to go, and we we all go. We have our retailers and our manufacturers that go to the trade show. But for a lot of us, it's work. It's a lot of work, and it's not as much fun um, as as going down to a great destination. So I'm very envious. I would love to be a part of the TAA for the fact is like they have one of the best, one of the most talked about vacation weekends, learning, smoking, socializing, obviously in exotic locations. So I'm, I, I'd love to be a part of it just for that reason. I don't care if I it, make, make a cigar or not. It, it was funny, Casey, you said that because um, there was a, a guy who works for a TAA retailer who asked me, and he, he didn't own the shop. But he asked me, hey, you go in the cover to TAA, right? I said, well, what am I going to cover there? He's like, who cares? He goes, you're just going to go there and party for four days. And and it was kind of funny. I'm like, yeah, well, maybe I will. But but to be honest, I don't, you know, I don't know. Because they're not a policy organization, I, 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 I it's not fair for me to say that that's what – I mean, obviously, many people who go to this convention on the manufacturer and retailer end are giving that perception that it's, it's four days of partying with this – one day I, I think, think there's a lot of education that goes on though um i mean i, I think there's i, I think yeah, there's I a think lot of education that goes on i haven't spent the time there i haven't been invited or or been able to participate but but i do kind of prod into some of the retailers of you know what does happen other than i mean the cigar business don't get me wrong our business is smoking cigars so right. to me like life is a party whatever your party may be like life is a party and the fact is like i think there's a lot of education that goes on i mean you have a lot of successful retailers that when I travel throughout the country, I mean, we use TAA members, um, uh, TAA members as kind of a standpoint of when we do research on, on new territories. I mean, that's a staple of, you know, these guys have done it. They've been there. They have an understanding of the retail business. So as a new company, we do use that as a basis of, of while we're exploring new and um, to try to get our roots based with some of those people that have been there, that have done that, that can um, basically represent the retailers as a, as a community and kind of point us in the right direction. That's a good point. 
I'll counter that though by saying, why can't they get rid of these TA cigars every year? There's still a lot of them sitting on the shelf. If these guys, are, I mean, that's the one part I'll counter them with. I, you know, I did have, I, I'm not going to name the retailers, but I did talk to several retailers on this topic. Every one of them came back to me saying there's too many cigars. They yeah, and I don't know the no, I don't know yeah. the numbers that they have. I mean, yeah. may, may, yeah. maybe they maybe it's gotten to the point where they have a lot of TAA cigars, and maybe that's the problem. It needs to be an exclusive club, and you know, it takes some exclusivity to get there. I mean, as the best retailers or some of the best retailers, a part of that club, uh, not necessarily the best, but essentially a lot of the, the the guys that have been around. So some people that have withstand the te test of time, we'll say. Um, but yeah, if they just let everybody make a TAA cigar, yeah, then it's not exclusive. So. Um, if it's gotten too deep, you know, they've got to figure out and maybe each step up their game at the point of making TAA cigars to the level of the ones that you recommended earlier that, you know, maybe they, you know, if they want to be that, that, that tier of ambiance to be able to sell through super limited edition through a few retailers, uh, you know, that's, a, that's the testament to, you know, making something that's that, but if there's just too many, there's just too many. And maybe that's, you know, kind of a testament to their own success. Yeah. I mean, one thing I actually talked to a TAA retailer, and he gave and he countered this point with me really. Well. I said, "Well, why don't you guys make the sampler pack of this, right?" Mm -hmm. And he said, "Actually, he said from my own retail standpoint, you know, this is before FDA and anything rules around samples." He said, "From my own retail point, I could do that." He goes, "The problem is we can't do it as the TAA because everyone has a different distribution. These cigars are coming in different, so mm -hmm. that would involve having to send them all to." the TAA and someone would have to do it. And that made, that made some sense. So he says, yeah. yeah, we could do it at the retail level. Certainly, you know, order custom boxes or put together things. And, and, and so that, that made some sense on that point. Do you know how many there, do you have any numbers of how many manufacturers are incorporated in TAA? I don't, I don't. Um, I believe there's, like I said, this year, it's pretty close somewhere between 15 and 17 cigars again this okay. year. Yeah. Um, it's about now what's happened is there's two types of, of limited cigars the TAA will put out. Um, they put out the annual exclusive series, right? Where basically it's a one and done for the year. Um, you know, and Pete Johnson's kind of a, you know, every year he's changed the size up of his for the most part. Crown Heads has done a different blend every year. And then there's some that are their ongoing production. So, like, for example, uh, there's an acid TAA cigar that's been out there that's been ongoing production. Um, they just announced uh, – well, Nat Sherman's got the Panamericana, which is mm -hmm. ongoing. Drew Estate uh, has moved the um, the Herrera Esteli Maduro into that ongoing piece. It was released. So they got a combination of, of those two things right now that are out there. You know, with some of them do become limited, uh, you know, ongoing production – there's been some TAA cigars that have made it out of the TAA. So, for example, Asylum with the Dictophilia, was a, which right. I thought was one of the better TAA cigars, actually. That was something originally they were going to release the market as a general release. They opted not to do it. And from what Tom Wazuka told me, they had too many other things going on. They gave it to the TAA for one year. And then after the TAA was done with it, they took it back and made it an ongoing production. And that goes back to the fact of, you know, having a limited that then goes regular production and it wasn't, you know, the value of it as a limited doesn't hold the same weight anymore. By the way, that I think I want that for next week's topic. I was going to mention <laughs> so dead serious, so, Yeah. So that was actually my idea for next week, but no, it, it, there's a, and that's a big, that is a major debate uh, going on right now, uh, especially with some companies out there. Yes. I think it's really up to the retailers, the TAA retailers to, they, they, in the end, they have the decision because if they don't buy them, they're not going to be creating them as much anymore. So if they if they are, you know, a little bit more picky about what they decide to bring in and things like that, then the the numbers will drop down into how many releases come out in a, in a year. But um, if they think that they can sell them, and I think that's what their whole goal is, is kind of be work as a peer group to, you know, help them sell. And obviously, they're, you know, these types of retailers are supposed to be the, the ones that can turn out, uh, you know, a lot of sales. Um, you know, maybe they're a little more confident than they they should be in getting rid of some if, if the old ones are still hanging around. You know, exactly, exactly. And, you know, I've been critical of some things in the TA. Um, I'm also very welcoming. I want to cover it. I want to cover these cigars still. Um, yeah, there's some cigars that are probably going to be better than others, but 
I, I do believe in a lot of these. I do know a lot of these retailers personally and they're great retailers. So I want to help them. You know, I'm looking, Hey, get some information on these cigars. Uh, tell me when they're available. I'll go buy them. I'm not looking for them for free here. Um, and I certainly, I want to help you guys promote what you're doing here. Right. Um, I'm just frustrated with you guys right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I just basically said, do I really want to keep doing this? But right. yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, Aaron, you mentioned, um, you know, there's a couple of TA cigars I do want to point out that have been, I think some standout cigars in the last couple of years. Um, I think the last two Tatawahes have been fantastic. The 15, the 16 is actually coming up for review finally on Cigar Coop. Um, I bought a bunch of those and they, they're unbelievable. I think that was the best of the 16 series as well as the 15 series. I'm going to give Crowned Heads credit with this year's release too. I think they did a very good job. Uh, for, for those who think I hate Crowned Heads, they don't. It was a very, they did a very good cigar, right? I think they, I think Ernesto did a, it was a broad leaf and that's one of Ernesto's, I think, Ernesto Perez Carrillo I'm talking about is it's one of the rappers he works with great. They did a, did a great job. The floor has done a very, very bang up job the last couple of years as well. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, the 48, and then they did an event only cigar called the celebration last year, right? which was a, uh, a broadleaf version. And I'm telling you what, that, that was a really good cigar. Um, and I like Terrera Esteli Maduro a lot. I'm glad that that's going to be continuing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are the same ones. I mean, I think I think it's just right the top tier, you know, Tatuaje, Crown Heads, uh, LFD. Um, but outside of those, you know, it's just the, those other cigars aren't. I, I don't consider them as special enough to be kind of considered that limit limited uh, area. Have you had any misses, like big misses lately, that just didn't meet your expectations? Um, I wouldn't say mind. they're big misses. I would just say that I, I would consider them an average cigar, and um, you know that's fine for regular production, I guess. But when you're, you know, supposed to be a limited edition, it's that's you're, it's, you're, even, it's even a bigger miss. That's that's where I'm going. You know, these were like I said, maybe I, my expectations was set eight or nine years ago too high. This is supposed to be best foot forward, best of the best. I just haven't seen as many of them lately. Yeah, I think the industry as a whole has kind of dropped the ball on the limited game. I mean, they do limited because they know they can sell them usually. Um, a lot of guys are now doing just limited runs because they know they can sell them um, because the the draw. And it's part of that's on the consumer to, you know, not fall for it. But, you know, if, they, if, they're, if they're selling them, they're going to keep doing it. Uh, right. If, if you're a retailer that can buy a minimum order, you're going to have your own cigar. Yeah. yeah. Now, I, guys, I'll give credit to like Skip Martin. He's very picky, I think, with, and I kind of noticed a little firsthand. He's very selective on the retailers he's going to give that to. He right. wants to make sure it represents Roma Craft in the best way, and he gives them very good cigars for that. And so I give him a lot. He has taken that very seriously, in my opinion, when it comes mm. to something like that. He would, I mean, I don't think he would, I don't know if he'd ever do a TA cigar. Imagine if he did. Right. Uh, he makes great cigars too. He makes great cigars. Yep. I mean, he would be not. I mean, there's a reason why Crown Heads went into the TAA series and has done so well. I mean, they had that that following, and then they come into the TAA, and I'm telling you, they, they've been one of the most successful ones they've had. Right. <laughs> yeah. So the uh, yeah no so that's that uh you know I know it's going to be interesting to see. What happens for the future with the TAA cigars, with FDA? I, right. you know, I'm imagining there have been TAA cigars introduced into market. I wonder if we're going to see some of these older, like, you know, predicate blends come back. You know, as something else. Possible. Yeah, that may be possible. You know, so that that's something. I I, I don't believe the TAA will ever stop producing an exclusive series. I heard someone say this may be the end of that. I don't I don't see it still. I think there's still some obviously they've been doing this for many years. They've the, the retailers do see an ROI on this stuff. Yeah, and I mean if they if they can utilize the TAA to kind of just do an initial offering and then see how it goes, and then if they go to regular production after that. I mean, as long as new cigars are gonna be able to come to the market, I don't see why it would stop for the TAA. Right. Right. I don't I don't either. Um you know, I always wondered, you know, I know we're getting to the end of the show here. I always wondered what would stop, you know, a group of other retailers from doing 
the same thing, forming a consortium and getting a group of exclusive cigars with some buying power. So people like, you know, maybe would, would do that. I, I've always wondered why that's not happened. You know, okay, I can't yeah. be a TA retailer, but I could be part of this other group. Right. I think it could be. I just wonder, you know, I'm assuming that they need to have a, uh, you know, a minimum order of some sort and how, if they can get enough retailers to do that and be able to right. commit to that. Yeah, because we got 40 retailers. They each buy 100 boxes. You can get a 4,000 box order pretty easy. Right. And there's factories that could do that. So I was, I don't know. That's just some food for thought there. It was just always something that's on my mind there. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have access to the TA cigars where you are? I don't have any retailers locally to me. So everything I get, I either have to get uh, online or, you know, kind of do trades or, you know, secondary market type stuff. Yeah. We have a, we actually have a very good one, Tinderbox of, uh, the Carolinas here. Um, and I think, you know, Stace, he works for them. Yep. And uh, Stace Berkland uh, works for Craig Cass, who's the president of IPCPR. Uh, great guy. Hopefully he won't be mad at me after my TAA comments <laughs> or my Rudy Giuliani comments. I don't <laughs> think people can really stay too mad at you, Coop. I mean, oh, you're... <laughs> I, let me tell you, Rudy, the Rudy Giuliani stuff is, is uh, not been <laughs> – no one's threatened me yet. So, <laughs> and I, so, But that's another story. But, no, like I said, we want everyone to succeed and do well here. So. Um, anyway, we're getting, uh, like I said, we're getting to the end of the show here. Any other final closing thoughts on this before we go to our last segment? No, I don't think so. Or closing segment, I should say. Oh, no. so. Nope. So, you know, again, um, I just want to, I want, first of all, I want to thank Casey, uh, Hogan, uh, great, great, uh, having you on, uh, show number one and, uh, show number one. and, um, I saw some good, I saw some good social media banter going on that, uh, your number two guy next week's a little sad. Oh yeah, so yeah, yeah. we got to, so so yeah, uh, so we go we're going right across the hall. <laughs> well, well, it's harder to see because I'm traveling. They uh, we hired somebody that actually runs that office, so I've I've given that those duties away. But no, those guys will always be forever in my hearts. And my 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 boy uh, Hector, uh, as uh, he's he says he's always number two, and you know he's a good number two. Yeah. yeah. So we're gonna have Hector Alfonso on for the entire show next week. Um, and, and if you want some controversial statements, you guys just stay tuned. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness! I'm like I I've actually been thinking everything I've been thinking of is not too controversial, but um, <laughs> yeah. I, eventually, I think um, I, yeah. So I think we're gonna have Hector on, and I'm sure, like I said, he, it won't be the first time either. Um, so yeah, we'll have Hector on as that. We'll we'll debut our debonair ideal. And we'll reveal what uh, our new name for this particular segment will be and uh aaron and i gotta i gotta finalize that as well by the way i uh the, the challenge coin contest is closed we have our winners um so again thanks to everybody and thanks for you know thanks for the support to everyone on that as well so as we mentioned we have hector on next week um danny vasquez is going to be coming on the week after to actually guest host with me um because aaron scared him away but <laughs> that's right uh, Aaron's running away. Actually, Dan, Danny, Danny, Danny thinks I hate him. So for some reason, <laughs> I don't know why. No, no. So you know, um, the idea of what I want to do with the show, and, and Aaron's first of all, I really the respect I have for what you do. Uh, I'm so glad you're a part of. This. We're gonna have. I mean, the idea is I want to bring the best of the best from cigar media and the cigar industry to t- to talk because I think that's where we can have this industry type talk. So there are some. I mean, we have some names coming up. Um, Surgeon's going to be coming on. I have one name who is like basically, let me put it, he's close to coming on on a, maybe once a month, but <laughs> till I get the blood from his hands, <laughs> I'm just not going to announce it yet, but it, it may be someone people know and love. So uh, we'll just kind of keep that one until I have it done. I don't want to let the cat out of the bag there. So um, with that, um, we're going to bring to close episode uh, one of the Cigar Coop Primetime Show. Uh, thank you, everybody who tuned in, liked us on social media. And uh, Casey, uh, I guess go crux yourself. Yeah. Go crux yourself. Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate it. Have a, we'll be on any time. Uh, we love doing these kind of things. This is, this is always a fun, you know, fun evening. I mean, you guys did start it at 10 o'clock Eastern time, which we might want to record the first half hour because we're getting past some of our bedtime. You guys on the West Coast – don't have to stay up as late, but we're looking at 1130 here. But, you know, it's always a pleasure. Both you guys, we appreciate uh, everything you guys do. Uh, CruxCigars.com, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Follow us, social media, Crux Cigars. And, yeah, just like Coop said, go Crux yourself. 
All right. Aaron, thanks again, buddy. All right, everyone. Have a great All night. Right. Thank, Thank you. you.